If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis, first book in the Bible, chapter 28. And while you're turning, I want to greet those of you in Montgomery County and Loudon, Prince William on Main Ave and different microsites. It's really good to be together across Washington around God's Word. We're in week three of reading through the story of Scripture together. So if you've not been a part of this, whether you're a member of the church or a visitor, uh, jump in with us. Or even if you started and have already kind of fallen back, like just jump in right now. We're taking this chronological journey through the Bible to see how this book totally transforms our lives. And today, I want us to think about blind spots in what we've read this last week and what we're going to read in this coming week and in our lives. So we all have blind spots, every one of us, areas of our lives where our vision is obscured, things that if we could just for a moment step outside of ourselves, we would realize how foolish or wrong something is, but inside of ourselves, we just don't see it. Or maybe we don't want to see it. On a personal level, over this last week, I had some people who love me point out a blind spot in me that I didn't see. And when they pointed it out, my first reaction was defensive. I didn't want to see it. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized something was wrong, and indeed, I didn't want to see it. So, so this can be personal, or it can be broader than that. And we're coming near the end of Black History Month, and there's no question that slavery is a glaring blind spot in American Christian history, right? Like, how could Christians and pastors who supposedly believe the gospel so easily rationalize the enslavement of other human beings. White churchgoers worshiping God together every Sunday, reading the Bible religiously all week long, all while using God's word even to justify treating men, women, and children as property to be bought, sold, and abused. They actually thought, convinced themselves they were being generous when they gave Slaves an extra chicken at Christmas. And it's not just slavery. Fast forward 100 years in history, you had Jim Crow laws where professing white Christians refused to eat in the same restaurant, drink from the same fountain, send their kids to the same school, or use the same restroom as a black person. Like We look back at that and think, how wrong was that? But somehow, so many white professing Christians couldn't see it makes you wonder what we're missing today, doesn't it? We've talked as a church about how racism, racialization remain realities around us, but even still we don't want to see it. I don't want to see it in my life, and it became clear to me when I preached on racism, not only here, but in other places over the last year, that others don't want to see it either. It's like we're blind to destructive and disproportionate ways race plays out in the world around us, and even in the church, which ever since slavery has been and still is one of the most segregated institutions in our country. The point is, the point is, slavery, racism is a glaring blind spot. But it's only one. Like, there are many others in the church. I was reading this last week how American Christians spend 95% of our offerings to the church on ministries for ourselves. About 4.5% on outward ministry in the world but on average, only about 0.5% on the people in the world who have the least access to the gospel. So in other words, we spend less than 1% of our offerings to the church. So we're not even talking about what we spend on ourselves. We're talking about what we give to the church. We spend less than 1% of what we give to the church getting the gospel to people who've never heard it. And we're trying to change that even in our church, yet you mark it down. In every church that talks about missions, including ours, people will inevitably say that we're spending too many resources getting the gospel to other people. I mean, we're just so out of whack, but it's like we can't see it. And it's not just in the church, it's in our lives. Again, this is where it started for me this last week, God using people in my life to uncover sin 
I didn't see and didn't want to see. We all have blind spots that we don't want to see. And what scares me when I think about a blind spot like slavery is we're talking about Bible-believing Christians. But apparently regular worship, even study the Bible, don't prevent blindness in us. Part of our sinful nature instinctively chooses to see what we want to see and to ignore what we want to ignore. Like it frightens me that it's possible for me to live my Christian life and even lead as a pastor in the church all while overlooking horrible evil. Now here's why I share all of this today. Because as I was reading God's word this week, I kept seeing this over and over and over again. If you read through this week's reading, if you read any from the past three weeks, have you not paused at different points and just thought, what were they thinking? Like there is some messed up stuff going on in Genesis. You have Abraham and Isaac both lying about their wives, saying they're their sisters, You have polygamy, multiple wives in these stories. You have competitive, spiteful childbearing through multiple wives. This was not God's design. Genesis 2, 24 was clear about God's design for marriage. A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to one wife. They will will become one flesh. You have Noah, the blameless one who was spared the flood, getting totally wasted right after the flood. You have Lot in an incestuous relationship with his daughters. You have all kinds of people being mistreated, misled. You have blatant sin, deception by patriarchs of faith. Jacob's very name means cheater or conniver. How about that for a founder in the faith? We've only made it through about 30 chapters of the Bible and one truth is abundantly clear. People are messed People sin in ways they don't even see. People just like you and just like me. So let's just go ahead and get it out on the table today. We are all messed up. And we are, yeah, I guess applaud that. I, I, maybe just, <laughs> that's kind of a low moment, isn't it? It's good to affirm. It's been a good day. All right, let's go. No. So, but it's, it's, it's good to realize, like, we are, all, we are all prone to sin in ways we don't even see. We all have blind spots. Coming into this week, I did not know what text we were going to dive into today. But as I was praying all week long, just asking God, what are you saying to us, the church, as we're reading through these passages? And I saw these stories unfold. And I saw sin in my life that I was blind to. I couldn't help but to think that maybe God desires to uncover some blind spots among us. In our lives individually, maybe even as a church. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is I want to hone in on one episode in Jacob's life that we're actually in the middle of reading about. So we're gonna start in Genesis 28, which we've already read, and then we're gonna end in Genesis 35, which we're scheduled to read tomorrow. And I wanna show you three truths about blind spots that we need to learn from Jacob's life. And you don't have notes written out for you this week on the back of that page you received when you came in, quite honestly, because Tuesday of this week, when it was time to turn those in, I had no idea where we'd be going. But I think it'll be pretty simple to write these down and I want to encourage you to write these down. And then I wanna encourage you to reflect on blind spots that may need uncovering in your life right now and maybe among us as a church. So let me, let me pray toward that end. Oh God, We need you to do in the next few minutes even what is not natural to us. God, we need your help. We need to see things we can't see. So I just pray, we pray together across Washington and the places we're gathered, we pray that you would supernaturally open our eyes. We we pray for humility to hear 
God, please keep us from being defensive. Please give us humility to hear and to see what you are calling us to hear from your word and see in our lives. And then, God, we pray for grace to respond to the the word that you're speaking to us and the grace you promise to us. So please, please help us right now, individually and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's, let's start in Genesis 28. Let me set up the context. So in Genesis 27, through deception, Jacob basically steals the blessing from Isaac, his father, that was intended for Esau, his brother. Esau was not happy. He vowed to kill Jacob. That's when Jacob decided it was ta- time to take a vacation away from home. So he packed his things, began a trip toward a place called Haran, where his uncle lived. That's where we pick up in Genesis 28, verse 10. Listen to what it says. Genesis 28, verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now let's pause for a moment here because that is one stout promise. God had made a similar promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15, and then Isaac in Genesis 26. In fact, our memory verse this last week was God's promise to Isaac in Genesis 26. So I'm gonna put it up here on the screen for us to read out loud together, and if you've memorized it, Try not to look at the screen. So close your eyes, look down, wherever, try to say it, but then we'll all say it together. Genesis 26, verse four, God said to Isaac, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and will give your offspring all these lands and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Well done. Now, when God says this to Jacob in Genesis 28, it's a particularly stout promise because Jacob was a single guy at this point. So he didn't even have a wife yet, and God promises to give him kids like the dust of the earth. And then God says, I'm gonna bring you back to this land where you are lying right now. So listen to how Jacob responds. Verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it, up a, set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace and the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So follow this. It's pretty simple. Jacob receives this promise from God, sets up an altar in this place. He says, this place where I slept last night is going to be God's house, Bethel. And I'm going to come back here. Now I want you to look at a map with me on the screen at this point. It'll help you understand the geography of what's happening here. So you look at this map down in the southwest corner, you'll see the city of Bethel. That's where Jacob is when he has this dream. Then look up, look up in the northeast corner and you'll see the city of Haran. That's where Jacob is headed. So Bethel is where God makes a promise to bring him back to this place. And Bethel is where Jacob says, I'm coming back to this place. Pretty simple. So what happens in Genesis 29 is Jacob makes the journey up to Haran. And in a long and twisted story that we don't have time to go into today, he ends up amassing a large family with many sons, a daughter, and a ton of possessions. And eventually, this, Jacob decides to come back, just like God had promised to him and just like he had promised to God. So turn me over now to Genesis 33. 
So we fast forwarding here about 20 years. Listen to what happens in verse 18. The Bible says, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram. And he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Hmm. Now look back at that map with me one more time and notice where Shechem is. Jacob had gone all the way up to Haran. He was headed back to Bethel, just like God had told him, just like he had told God he would do. But you see just north of Bethel, a place called Shechem. Shechem is about 20 miles short of Bethel. 20 miles short. And this is where, if you're taking notes, I want you to see the first truth about blind spots. I want you to see that blind spots often seem small and subtle. Blind spots often seem small and subtle. 20 miles short. Jacob was almost there. To the place God had told him to come back to. To the place he had told God he was going to come back to. There was good business there, good opportunities for making money, increasing possession. So he buys a plot of ground. Just put yourself in Jacob's shoes. Imagine his thought process. I'm close enough, right? It's not like I'm going off here or there to the north or to the east. I'm within 20 short miles. It's not that big a deal. And this is the way sin works in all of our lives, particularly sin that we don't want to see. I'm not doing that bad, right? I mean, I could be doing a lot worse. Just think back to the slavery example. Like, I don't treat my slaves as bad as other people do. Or 100 years later with Jim Crow laws, it's not like black people are slaves anymore. It's just a different water fountain. Fast forward to today. We're drinking out of the same water fountains. Racism is a thing of the past. All while we ignore racial injustice in the present, here and around the world. Do you see this tendency in our lives? And again, slavery, racism, that's just one example. In so many facets of our lives, we are tempted to stop short and settle for less than all God has called us to. And to think it's not a big deal because it could be worse. We're pretty close. I mean, it's not like I'm sleeping around. I'm just looking at some images on my phone or a computer. It's just thoughts I entertain. I'm not actually acting on them. Let's be honest with each other. We are so desensitized to sexual immorality that it doesn't shock us to watch it on a screen or indulge in it in our lives. Like we could be worse, right? It's other areas. We gossip. Like who doesn't? It's almost like the air we breathe in ways we don't even recognize. Materialism, it's our way of life. It's normal to prioritize spending on ourselves, give so relatively little to those in urgent need. And the picture is not just things we do, but things we stop short of doing. That's the whole picture here. I think about singles across our church who are tempted to stop short and God's call to purity and holiness and single-minded devotion to him. Again, you could be a lot worse. I think about married men and women tempted to stop short of loving and caring for and serving and nurturing our spouses as God has called us to. Parents tempted to stop short of teaching our kids to pray and study God's word and prioritize what really matters in the world. And we justify not praying with them or reading the Bible with them or prioritizing things that really matter because, well, I mean, we could be a lot worse. Children tempted to disobey parents in small, subtle ways, right? It's not that big a deal. Like, we could go on listing examples all day long, but do you see the strategy of Satan in your life? In our lives, Satan does not normally come to us and tempt us to just immediately jump off the deep end. Instead, he tempts us to stop this short, 
Because the reality is, if he can get you to stop this short at this point, he can get you to stop a little shorter, a little shorter, a little shorter. And before long, you're in a place where you're wondering, how, how did I get here? Blind spots often seem small and subtle, like they're no big deal. And did you notice the first thing Jacob does when he stops short? He buys this piece of land in Shechem. He sets up an altar and he calls it El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. Here is Jacob living in disobedience, stopping short of what God has told him to do, what he told God he would do. And the first thing he does is he sets up an altar. Please don't miss this. You might write this down. Religion is the biggest cover up for sin we don't want to see. Religion is the biggest cover-up for disobedience in our lives. Amen. All throughout the Bible then, and all throughout this room and other campuses today, we have mastered the art of religious activity before God, devoid of relational obedience to God. See it in church-going slave owners in the past. See it in the rampant materialism across the church in the present. See it in every single one of our lives. We can actually fool ourselves into thinking we're doing all right as long as we're in church, as long as we pray, read the Bible here and there, as long as we have some semblance of religious activity when the reality is God is not interested in our religion. Amen. God is interested in our obedience. God does not desire. He's actually sickened by our songs and our prayers when they are disconnected from the surrender of our lives. Amen. So let's ask ourselves today, like right now, in services where we're singing and praying, like let's just stop for a minute and ask, where am I stopping short? Where are you stopping short right now? In your life, think, think head, hard hands, like in what ways are your thoughts not completely honoring to God? In what ways are your desires not completely pleasing to God? In what ways are your actions not bringing glory to God? In what ways are your relationships not reflecting God? Like how, where are you stopping short? And I ask this question not just of followers of Jesus because there are others today who are exploring Christianity and you're being tempted to stop short and say, hey, I'm a pretty good person and I'm here in church, aren't I? Like, I don't need to take this step of surrendering my life to following Jesus. I'm doing all right. And maybe some of you who might call yourself a Christian, but you've settled into a pretty casual, nominal, in name only Christianity that is content to give Jesus a nod here or there in your life when the reality is he is not your life. But you could be worse, right? All across this room and other campuses, don't miss it. Blind spots often seem small and subtle, like they're no big deal and we convince ourselves they're no big deal which leads right into the second truth we need to see blind spots eventually prove extremely costly blind spots eventually prove extremely costly so read what happens in Shechem just 20 miles short of Bethel. Chapter 34, verse one. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. Just in case you didn't catch what just happened, Dinah, Jacob's only daughter, was just violated by the son of the ruler in Shechem. 
What happens after that is Jacob actually enters into discussions with the men of Shechem and they agree because this, this son of the ruler wanted to be married now to Dinah. And so the men of Shechem agree to be circumcised, which is a whole other part of the story here in Genesis that we don't have time to go into today, but it was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the men of Shechem agree to it in order to be able to have business dealings now with all of Jacob's sons. So basically now you have an entire city faking religion to gain a business advantage, which all leads to verse 25. Watch this with me. Chapter 34, verse 25. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, whatever was in the city and the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. A horrifying picture as Jacob's sons become murderers. They kill every male in Shechem. They loot the entire land. If we were to keep going, we would see by this time, Jacob's house is filled with foreign gods and idols. Do you see the picture? This is Jacob, the one who had received God's promise of blessing. His daughter has now been violated. His sons have become murderers, could have started all out war in the land of Canaan. His house is full of idols and it all happened because he stopped 20 miles short. No big deal, right? Ladies and gentlemen, Jacob had no idea what his blind spot, his seemingly small, subtle stopping short would cost not only him, but the people around him. And I pray that God in his word today would help us to see that God would open our eyes to this same truth in our lives. You and I in this room, this is God speaking to his word. We have no idea what it will cost, not only each of us, but people around us when we settle for what seems like small, subtle disobedience in our lives. Just, just think about the examples we've mentioned. Slavery, lack of civil rights, racism was and still is extremely costly to generations of people. Materialism, the idolatry of money, the love of more possessions while ignoring the poor is extremely costly. Sexual immorality doesn't just cost you, it costs your spouse, your future spouse, it costs your kids, your family. Looking at that sight, that image doesn't just affect you. It affects those closest to you. And not just people close to us, people far from us. Are there not so many people in the world today who look in the church and see pastors, leaders, professing followers of Jesus who live just like everybody else in the world, just as corrupt, just as sexually immoral, just as selfish. All they do is tack Jesus on Sundays and the world says, I don't get it and I don't really want anything to do with it. Compromise with sin is extremely costly for the display of Christ to a world that desperately needs to see his sacrificial love and his selfless life on display. Don't underestimate the cost of what seems like small, subtle sin. The Bible is filled with stories like this. We will read them. We've actually already read them. Lot's wife in Genesis 19, she simply, subtly glances back, right? When she's been told by God not to do so, all of a sudden, she's dead. It's Moses, seemingly simple, small, subtle sin in the book of Numbers that keeps him from going into the promised land. When we get to Joshua chapter seven, we'll see a man named Achan steal some possessions, hide them under his tent to keep for himself, which leads to 36 people being killed, then his whole family, his wife and children dying. Joshua seven is a potent picture of how your sin inevitably affects not only your physical family, but also your spiritual family. Your sin, my sin, our sin affects people in our home, people in our church. We can keep going on and on. King David's simple, subtle glance on a rooftop one day leads to death and destruction across the entire kingdom he led. Oh God, open our eyes to the cost of compromise in our lives. 
Ladies and gentlemen, don't believe it. I urge you, don't believe it. Don't believe the lie that your sin only affects you. It's not true. Hear the Bible saying loud and clear this week. It's not true. Sin, particularly the blind spots that we don't want to see, that we refuse to see, inevitably prove extremely costly to you and to people around you. Is this not heavy? Like it almost feels hopeless. But it's not. So here's the good news, and this is what I love about the Bible. The Bible does not shy away from hard realities in this world. The Bible does not paint a glossy picture that's disconnected from our experience. The Bible is true to the hard, messed up realities of life. But it doesn't leave us there. The Bible leads us to hope. Thankfully, this story in Jacob's life doesn't end with the cost of compromise in Genesis 34. Genesis chapter 35, verse one. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel because, this, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Oh, is anybody today here thankful to worship a God who gives second chances? Amen. Or anybody? Anybody thankful for third chances and fourth and fifth and sixth and over and over and over again? Oh, please don't miss this last truth about blind spots from the story of Jacob. When God, by his grace, opens our eyes, blind spots can become new starts. When God, by his grace, opens our eyes, blind spots can become new starts. God comes to Jacob and he says, it's time for a new start. Clean a house, get rid of the foreign gods you are worshiping, and go to the place I told you I'd take you. And don't miss the beauty of this passage. Did you catch verse 3? Jacob said, let us arise and go to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Don't miss it. This is such good news. This is our hope for all who trust in God. Even when we stop short, even when we compromise with sin, the holy God of the universe answers us in the day of our distress. He is with us. He has been with us the whole time. In the middle of our disobedience, hear this good news. In the middle of our disobedience, even then God does not abandon us. This is grace. This is the gospel. This is the greatest news in all the world. God has not left sinners alone in their sin. God is not just with us. He came to be with us in the person of Jesus. Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus died on the cross for all of our stopping short, for all of our stopping way short. Jesus has died for all of our sin. He's made a way for us, no matter how far we've stopped short. Jesus has made a way for us to be forgiven of our sin, cleansed of all of our sin, and restored to right relationship with God. All glory be to Jesus. Oh. All glory, all glory be to the God who does not abandon us in our sin. All glory be to the God who saves us from our sin. 
and purifies us from it. God says to Jacob, get up and leave this behind. Come and experience all that I've designed for you. God says to us, you don't have to live in your sin. You don't have to stay 20 miles short or 200 miles short. I will lead you to experience that which is best for you. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, all across this room and other campuses right now, I hear the God of the universe saying to you right now, I am the author of new starts. Let me open your eyes to see sin in your heart and your life and let me lead you to experience the full abundant life I have created for you. And it is indeed abundant. Look at what happens in verse nine. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, verse 10, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Oh, you see this? God says to Jacob, you're, you're no longer gonna be called Jacob, cheater, conniver. You now have a new name, Israel, one who strives with God. God gives him a new name. Oh, don't, don't miss this in your life. It's not the exact same as Jacob. God doesn't change your name to Israel. But when you come to God and you trust in his grace, when you put your faith in Jesus as the savior of your sin, you surrender your life to him, God says, you are no longer named guilty. You are now named righteous. You are no longer called slave to sin. You are now called free from sin. You are no longer headed toward eternal death. You now have eternal life. You are no longer called condemned before God. You are now called a child of God. No longer named sinner. You are now named a son or daughter of God. By his grace, God gives us a new name and he gives us new life. Keep going in verse 11. God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you and will give the land to your offspring after you. And God went out from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Oh, Jacob had no idea what God had in store for him if only he would get to Bethel. A nation and a company of nations will come from you. Kings shall come from your own body. What does that mean? Well, we'll see it in the next week or so because in Genesis 49, we're gonna read about how one of Jacob's sons, Judah, receives a promise that one day from his line will come a king to whom all nations will bow. And in the rest of the story over the course of this year, a king named David will come from the line of Judah. And later in the year, through the line of King David, will eventually come a king named Jesus. Jacob had no idea what God was going to do in and through his line. If only he'd get to Bethel. But think about it. What if? Like, just play what if for a second. What if there in Shechem, where Jacob had stopped, Dinah had been violated. His sons have become murderers. What if they had started all that war in the land of Canaan? What if Jacob's family had been put in major jeopardy at that point? What if something had happened to Judah? Without Judah, you don't have the line of David. Without the line of David, you don't have the line that leads to Jesus. Without Jesus, every sinner, including you and me, dies in separation from God's salvation. Now, obviously, that's not how this story unfolds. Praise God, he is sovereign in accomplishing his purpose to save sinners. But don't miss the whole picture. From the beginning of the Bible, Jacob had no clue what God would do in and through him if only he would get to Bethel. And I'm convinced, ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that you have no idea what God wants to do in and through your life, if only you will give yourself to him and all that he is calling you to do. Me to do, us to do together. Like I, I want to experience, I so want to experience all that God wants to do in and through my life. Don't you? Don't you want to experience all that God who created you and knows what is best for you, what he has designed you to experience in your life? Yes. Don't we want to experience together as a church all that God wants to do in and through us? Like we don't want to settle for this, 
monotonous, religious, casual routine? Don't we want to be a part of something so much greater than ourselves here in Metro DC, around the world? Don't we want to experience God's grace to the fullest extent we can and spread God's glory to the farthest ends of the earth? Uh, Let's do it. Let's not stop short. Let's ask God to open our eyes to blind spots in our lives. Let's ask God to help us see sin that we don't want to see. Oh, please don't miss this. I'll hit this really quick, but it's really important. Two major barriers. As I was praying through this, to God opening our eyes to blind spots in our lives, one is isolation. Isolation from true, biblical, multifaceted fellowship in the body of Christ. One of the reasons we don't see blind spots is because we don't have other brothers or sisters in Christ around us who will help us see them. And I would say in particular, brothers and sisters who are different from us, ethnically, socioeconomically, at different ages and stages of life, who will help us see. If we isolate ourselves or even surround ourselves with and listen to only people who look like us and think like us, then we will be much more prone to live with blind spots. We need to be in true, biblical, multifaceted fellowship where we're listening to and learning from people who are different from us with humility. Which leads to the second major barrier to seeing blind spots in our lives, pride. Pride, as I I have prayed for you coming into today, my biggest fear is that some of you will hear this word from God today and you will walk away saying, I I don't have blind spots in my my life. I don't wanna see blind spots in my life. I'm fine in Shechem. It's not too far off. (laughs) Or some will say, I'm so far off, so far short, I'm so far from Bethel, I don't even know where to begin. I just want to urge you, whether you are one mile short or 1,000 miles short, I want to urge you to say to God today, I want to experience all that you have for me. Please open my eyes to sin I don't want to see. Please keep my pride from getting in the way. Please open my eyes to sin that I need to see in my life. Please grant me the humility to hear and then the courage and the faith to leave it behind, to trust in you and by your grace to experience all that you have for me. Would you say that to God today? Like specifically. Just think about even examples we've used today. Like God rid us of any and all racism in our hearts and minds. Make us the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multifaceted church you desire for us to be. Help us to live for justice in a world where racism remains a reality. God rid us of materialism. Make us the sacrificial, generous, compassionate, selfless people you desire for us to be spreading your grace in a world of urgent need. God, make us the husbands and the wives and the parents and the children and the single men and women you've called us to be in a confused world. God, cause our thoughts to be completely aligned with your thoughts. God, cause our desires to be completely aligned with your desires. God, cause our actions to look more and more like Jesus. God, uncover our blind spots and cause us to be and do all that you've called and created us to be and do. So here's how I wanna close. I want to give you just a moment to pause and to reflect. Here at other campuses, I wanna invite you to pray and ask God if, now some of you already know, it's clear in your life, like even as we've walked through this word, the spirit of God has been opening your eyes to places where you're stopping short, some of you need to just stop and say, God, what sin do I need to see in my life? And I wanna invite you to take a couple of minutes right where you are to write out your reflections there in your notes or maybe on a device you have, maybe to write. Maybe it's, God, please forgive me for, and then you just fill in the blank. Or maybe it's, God, I want to do this or that that you're calling me to do. Help me to do this or that that I know you're calling me to do or to stop doing this or that that I know you're calling me not to do. Maybe it's to say for the first time truly to God, 
I wanna trust in Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I wanna follow Jesus as Lord of my life. I, I pray that that new start might happen. All across this room and other campuses today, like, like you hear that final truth, when God by his grace opens our eyes, blind spots can become new starts. So what does a new start need to look like for you today? And in light of the fact that God is the author of new starts, I think it's pretty awesome for us just to spend a few minutes before him all across this room, and other campuses, just saying, God, what new starts need to happen in our hearts and lives? You just pray accordingly. So I want to invite you just to begin spending that time right now with him. You know, one of the things I was thinking about, you might be hesitant to write down certain things where you're stopping short or sin because you got people around you, which obviously they shouldn't be looking at what you're writing. Uh, <laughs> Jacob, cheater, conniver. Anyway, you know, there's no cheating. Like, don't, anyway. The, so just stay focused on what you got. But even, even if you still don't want to write, just put a star or something. Like, you and God know what's, What's going on there? God, I, I confess this to you. Like, you know what that is. But uh, let me just invite us to do this right now. Like, we're not, we're not just going through religious motion Sunday after Sunday. Like, this is, we're, we're before a holy God right now. And he's speaking a trust to us. Like, how do we need to respond? So let me invite you to start to respond now, just between you and God, where you're sitting. And then after a few minutes, I'll, I'll close this in prayer. If you're still writing, praying, please, by all means, continue. Don't let me stop you, but I want to lead us in prayer together. Oh, God, we, we need you. We need your help. We are all, and I put myself at the front of the line, we're all prone to stop short. in so many different ways. 
We need you to save us from ourselves, to save us from what we think is best, what we think is good, what we think is wise, instead of trusting what you say is best and what you say is good and what you say is wise. I need you to save us from our impulse to do this or that that is not glorifying to you. God, please help us. Just, and we praise you, even as we pray this, we praise you that you answer us in the day of our distress. You are with us, that you have come to be with us. Jesus, we praise you for coming to pay the price for all of our sin. And not only to die for it so we can be forgiven of it, but to set us free from it. We, we trust your promise today that we don't have to stay in Shechem. That these sin, even sin that feels like so controlling in our lives, that it doesn't have control over us when we are in you that you have given us victory over sin. So God, we pray that we would experience it. Help us to walk in that victory. Help us to go with you to Bethel to experience all that you have for us in our lives. God, I pray for that. My own life, I pray for that for every single person sitting in this room and other campuses right now. And God, we pray for that for us as a church. We want to experience all that you have for us individually and together as a church. So. Help us to trust you. Give us humility to see sin we don't want to see, to turn from it, and by your grace to run into all that you have created us for and called us to. May it be so, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.